Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was established by the World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations Environmental Program. A lot of people think the IPCC is a group of scientists. Strictly speaking, that's not true. The IPCC is a group of governments. About 190 governments from across the globe who wanted information on the state of the climate and its human origin. Well, good evening, my friends, and this is Sandy Shellis, and I'm actually not going to be on tonight. I am uh, leaving you in the capable hands of 
our wonderful Antonio Reed, climate change researcher extraordinaire and commentator, and Jim Oceanographer Massa, Science Talk with Jim Massa. There's a lot going on tonight, and I'm really, really happy to turn the reins over. I hope you liked my video. I'm always full of those, you know, lovely, strange videos. So, guys, I'm going to give it to you. Antonio, you are up. All right. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, hey, Jim, I hope you're doing okay. I'm doing well. Finally, uh, good to be talking with you, Antonio. <laughs> All right. And to our audience uh, for the Environmental Coffee House, thank you for being here. Today, we have another very important talk. We want to break down um, some of our skepticism of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and um, pose some serious analysis of uh, the most recent uh, leaked IPCC report. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to also, for our audience, give them a brief kind of political history of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, so as stated in the promo video, as you saw, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was officially commissioned um, and uh, accepted by the UN General Assembly in 1988. Um, two years later, the IPC would release its first report, uh, first assessment, AR1. Um, this report was seminal in the fact that it cleared up, at least for the international community, this question of the reality of climate change and its cause, namely human, acti human activity, particularly human industrial activity, the emittance of CO2 and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Uh, the IPCC released its second report in 1995, uh, leading up to what would be the Rio summit. Um, that work was important uh, for international and government, international leaders and governments in um, developing what would be the two degrees Celsius target. Uh, the next report the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released was then 2000, following the failure of the, proto of the Kyoto Protocols. Um, the 2000 IPCC assessment was namely to help policymakers navigate a post-Kyoto world. Uh, and of course, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, along with the Vice President of the United States at the time, Al Gore, uh, one or former Vice President of the United States, Al Gore, won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007 um, for their educating um, mass public campaigns on climate change. And of course, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, won the prize for their contributions to the state of knowledge, uh, namely their projections for a global average temperature rise over the next century. Um, between three and five degrees Celsius on the current pathway. And uh, for sea level rise, their estimates were 18 to 56 centimeters where their likely range with an extreme scenario or extreme case uh, of one meter or three feet uh, for our American viewers. Uh, then of course, climate change was getting ahead and uh, the document that became the daunting fifth assessment um, was leaked in parts of 12 and was officially released in 13. And uh, this assessment became really the groundwork for uh, today's present political discourse and what would be the Paris Accords. Uh, the understanding that we got from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's fifth assessment was that in fact climate change uh, was carrying on um, at an accelerating rate, um, that the average amount of warming uh, over the 20th century had been about uh, a tenth of a degree Celsius, uh, and firmly um, understanding or beginning to quantify and qualify the impacts of a degrees of, of, of a 1.5 uh, and two degrees Celsius warmer world comparatively to the middle of the uh, 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 19th century. Uh, and then the IPCC released in 2018 
their special report on one and a half degrees. Uh, really, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was petitioned um, or quite demanded by the uh, Pacific Island countries and many other small island country states uh, to look at and assess more closely um, the relative impacts of one and a half comparatively to, to a two degree target. Um, and of course, uh, this uh, one and a half degrees uh, or 1.5 assessment also gave us the timeline that we have only at the time 12 years to reduce emissions uh, by 45 to 50 percent of the 2010 level, which was their requirement in order to avert the worst aspects of climate catastrophe. Um, and, and as I'm going to kind of give over the phone a little bit here uh, to Mike, or excuse me, to Jim, excuse me, um, to talk about the most recent IPCC report, uh, the Daunted Six assessment um, was leaked, and, and here's what Jim has to say. Well, uh, thank you, Antonio. Um, it was interesting, uh, Guy McPherson actually the other day posted a video where in the video he discusses how IPCC in preparing the latest uh, full-on report, which will probably be published at the earliest in 2022, that the IPCC might finally be acknowledging exponentiation, which, it, it, you know, to me, it's almost like a little too, uh, too little too late on their part, but it's, it's good that they're actually considering that because as I'll show you in uh, one of the uh, boxes that the, one of the pages from the last full report that they put out, when you look at the modeling, even with the different scenarios that they're graphing, when you look at it, it's all linear or in sometimes more of a logistical uh, function as opposed to an exponential or exponential, exponentiation uh, of function. Uh, some of the things, you know, looking at the, uh, the last report, the verbiage that they use, and you can tell that the final report was not prepared by scientists because the such as, oh, it's likely, it's likely this, highly likely this, and et cetera. The scientists would put confidence intervals around the data whatever if they're saying well we're seeing temperature of, of you know increase of say this amount you're going to put you should put confidence intervals around it basically saying that the range could be or the true increase would be in this in this uh, range of value highly likely likely very likely that's ambiguous that really does not in you know speaking as a scientist i see that and i'm like saying well, what the hell does that mean how do you define likely, very likely? Can you give a confidence interval uh, uh, on that? I mean, it's extremely subjective and science is really supposed to be about being objective. So I had some issues with that. And of course the uh, methane gets mentioned extremely in passing. Uh, they include just, I just saw one graph that had methane in it. And it was showing the methane levels increasing. They pretty much bypass the oceans, and that to me is annoying, not because I'm an oceanographer, but because the oceans really are the drivers of climate. It's not the atmosphere. Atmosphere, of course, has a role, but it's the oceans that are driving the climate. And the same thing, so, and they put some graphs, so, okay, ocean heat content, and, and, and they mention that the oceans absorb the heat, but they're not mentioning the ramifications what that means and people need to understand that when the oceans have absorbed 93 percent of greenhouse gas emissions since 1971 think about it that's seven percent that stayed in the atmosphere and look what that seven percent has wrought so what do you think is going to happen with that other 93 percent as that heat starts to diffuse into the atmosphere. 
which the oceans are uh, strongly stratifying. So the heat is not even being sequestered to depth anymore. I mean, you've got 200, uh, over 200 zettajoules of uh, latent heat energy absorbed by the oceans. 168 of that is in the upper 500 meters or so of the oceans. You start stratifying the oceans, that heat doesn't get sequestered, that heat is eventually going to be diffused into the atmosphere. In fact, o ocean currents are, are warming now. That warming, uh, that warmer water is being transported into the Arctic Ocean. And even though it's denser water when it enters the Arctic Ocean, maybe warmer, but it's a higher salinity, so it's going to sink down. It's still going to diffuse upward, and it starts melting uh, the sea ice from below. Then after it melts the sea ice, it diffuses into the atmosphere. So we're seeing that. And when you have that much ocean warming in the upper 500, 700 meters or so, think of the thermal expansion that that will bring about. You know, we have the island nations that are under direct threat of being submerged because of that. And here's another thing. And I'm not seeing this in the reports. Basically, there's a lot of things missing in these reports. I mean, they, they write out these huge 170-page things, and they leave out a lot. It kind of makes you wonder. But ocean productivity. Yes, you need stratification to lock the nutrients so that the, within the photic zone so that the phytoplanktons can do their thing. But it has to also be renewed. You need mixing events. Basically, you need whatever stratification develops, you need that to break down, have some vertical mixing of the water column, and then next stratification sets up, the nutrients are in place for the phytoplankton. If you've got this basically now permanent stratification, you're going to lose the nutrients are going to eventually run out. Then what do the phytoplanktons do? You know, they're not going to be, uh, there's not going to be productivity, food web collapses. And we're starting to see signs of that. I, I just saw a report, and, I'm, and I'm, uh, I'm actually reading the paper now, just got published, of how the Oyashio, uh, which is in the Northwest Pacific Ocean, that's the, the Japan, uh, one of the uh, currents off Japan, uh, the deep water formation, or at least the vertical sinking, is slowing down there as well. And this uh, paper is looking at the, uh, the reduction in productivity. Um, so basically, if the food web starts collapsing the oceans, a lot of people depend on their food from the oceans. But also the phytoplankton supply 55 to 80 percent of atmospheric oxygen. And oxygen has already been measured to be on the decline because of declining ocean productivity. I'm not seeing that in the IPCC reports. And that to and me Jim, is I did extremely... want to make a, a clarification, though, that the intergovernmental panel on climate change, uh, when you say methane, that they don't include that, you're talking about specific uh, methane from terrestrial and subsea permafrost, not anthropogenic sources of methane, because the IPCC does talk about anthropogenic emissions uh, of methane, particularly from the agricultural sector or the economy. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, you know, they, for some reason, discount uh, the methane releases from basically permafrost uh, substrates, be it terrestrial or submerged, which, uh, you know, as you look at the work of, say, Natalia Shakova and Igor Semelotov, uh, it's, it's a significant, it, let's put it this way, it's a non-trivial amount. Um, you know, you have fracking, of course, that's, an, you know, that's an anthropogenetic, uh, source. So are uh, rice paddies also, you know, from agriculture. So yes, they look at those two, but that's not the complete methane story. And when you, you know, looking at some of the, uh, assessments that Igor and other, uh, and Natalia and other researchers have made of the permafrost source. I said it's not trivial, 
it is being released, it is a major contributor, but also remember that methane oxidizes down at the CO2. So in one form or another, it's going to linger and still contribute to uh, the overall uh, you know, CO2 equivalence, which is why it's now more and more, uh, it's becoming more mainstream uh, that we're seeing, instead of just CO2, we're seeing CO2 equivalence uh, being reported in the literature. And when you look at that, which also includes nitrous oxide, that we're pushing 600 ppms, which is uh, significant and is of definite concern. So when you, you know, the, the IPCC leaves out a lot of things. They, it's almost like they look at basal things, but they leave out a lot of, of the analysis. They, they don't really, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, but they don't really touch upon the, the implications, the ramifications of all that is happening. And that, to me, um, is something that needs to be uh, addressed and improved upon. Well, and I wanted to say just because, uh, you know, my background is international relations, comparative politics. And one of the things I did uh, in the university was dissect and analyze how uh, in international institutions operated. And, you know, the IPCC has a specific mandate, right? That is to um, inform uh, and make recommendations, um, not policy recommendations, scientific recommendations for the an analyzing of climate change um, to governments. And so it's very limited in what it's actually able to do. Um, as you know, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change doesn't actually conduct any research itself. Um, and so it has to fill research from around the world and that building process is actually a very political process. Um, you know, what sort of documents are actually able to go into um, the IPC's review process uh, is also important and, and kind of dictates the sort of work that you get. Um, of course, they only look at peer reviewed papers and so that's already a limitation on the sort of things the IPC can actually factor in. Uh, but more importantly, governments have uh, agendas, right? They don't want to be told certain things. And so I think in part, the IPC has to recognize or does recognize, unfortunately, that um, to include these other feedbacks and contributaries to climate change would mean that the sort of policy framework that uh, policymakers are using to quote unquote, uh, adapt and mitigate the climate change would be completely unworkable. Um, and, and one of the important critiques that I just want to bring to people is that the integral impel on climate change is not, for example, uh, like the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the United States, uh, whereas the NOAA is entirely a scientific civic institution. Uh, the IPC is a political slash um, scientific institution that is mainly focused on science communication. Um, so it's, it's a very different sort of mandate than what we think about in terms of empirical and objective scientific inquiry. Um, the intergovernmental climate change, depending on climate change is uh, largely funded by governments who have an interest in the sort of work that uh, the panel is doing, okay? Uh, so the top contributors, of course, are the United States and countries like Saudi Arabia. Um, and that to me also brings in a level of skepticism. In fact, how much do we want to rely on countries like Saudi Arabia for our type of climate policy or the United States for that matter? Um, so, so those are things that I think people have to also keep in mind. Um, my own just personal criticism, when I think that people can see that, you know, there's a problem with the IPC is even in its goals, right? Um, of one and a half and, and the language is keeping to well below two. So the aspirational goal, um, understanding the IPCC framework is one and a half. And the uh, commitment is to keep temperatures well below two. But this sort of 
policy framework that uh, the IPC has to advise under is completely unworkable. I mean, what does it mean that global average temperature is well below two, but the aspirational limit is one and a half? I mean, I'm not a scientist, but uh, to me, anything above one and a half would not count as well below two degrees. Well, uh, first of all, you're correct in that the IPCC is a political body. Uh, I've had my personal dealings with them. Uh, so, uh, and it was uh, frustrating. I'll be blunt, totally frustrating. Um, I see nothing wrong, and it's a good thing that they look at the peer review papers because that's really the best method that we have for, you know, making sure the science is as good as it, as it is. Um, so I, ha so I have no problem with that. In fact, it's good that they look at the peer review papers. But as you said correctly, it's not so much what they include, it's what they don't include. And that's where the frustration really gets in. And it's become, it, it's point where, well, well, this is, we don't want to put this study in because this study is really, you know, it doesn't fit, oh, as you just said, the agenda. And in my view, that's doing a disservice to the, to, the, to the human race. To be quite blunt about it. You can't, this is something that as, as recent events, I think have uh, awakened the, pl uh, the planet. You know, the fires, the floods, the torrential rain, etc. Uh, it, it, it's come home to roost. And, the, the, you know, climate change is here. It's it's doing it's doing what uh, many of us had projected would do, but the pro those projections never made it into the reports, and that's where the frustration comes into. Right, and the government. Uh, one of the things that I bring to people's attention, um, particularly as somebody who's more involved in um, the politics of climate change is that when it comes to uh, policy making in the United States, particularly in our military apparatus, uh, the Pentagon doesn't rely on intergovernmental panel on climate change reports to understand climate change dynamics around the world. Um, what the Pentagon does is it puts together um, intersectional uh, committees and um, reports. Uh, the landmark report that I'm referring to, of course, is their age of consequences, uh, which the, the first part of that was released in 2007. Um, and this report, what it does is it doesn't only talk about the scientific implications of climate change, which are very important to understand, uh, but it also tries to understand how dynamic feedbacks um, interact in the climate system as well, and what sort of policy implications that would have. So I think the work is so seminal. Uh, they put together three scenarios, roughly. Um, they have what's called an expected scenario, a severe scenario, and a catastrophic scenario. And in their severe scenario, which I think is actually the most realistic scenario because it includes dynamic feedback, they find that global average temperature uh, is on a trajectory in, from 2007 to reach um, close to two degrees Celsius above the 1990 baseline. Um, that's the uh, figure they use. In their expected scenario, uh, this scenario doesn't include dynamic feedback. They have global average temperature reaching close to 1.3 degrees Celsius above 1990 by 2040. Um, and the implications of this in the report are quite stark. Um, they talk about the end of international relations in terms of uh, global mitigation and adaptation strategies. Uh, they talk about rampant militarism and the collapse of multilateral systems, including the UN Security Council and the UN itself. Um, these are much more dire reports. Uh, so one thing I illuminate the people is that, in fact, there are two sort of conversations happening on climate change. There's the public conversation, which is 
um, really that narrative is dictated by whatever comes out from the IPCC every five to six years. And of course it's intervening um, uh, reports. And then there is the kind of more private governmental conversations that are going on, which are much more serious about climate change impacts um, that you can find that sort of literature and conversation uh, in documents like the age of consequences which of course this work has been continued to be done since 2007 um, even looking at the national oceanic and atmospheric administration uh, their projections for sea level rise are much more dynamic than what we get from the ipcc for example um, the ipcc is just now admitting that we we are on the verge of getting two meters of sea level rise um, by the end of the century the six feet uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric uh, Administration in the United States had projections in 2017 that were showing not our not just a projection in general, but a trajectory. And the difference between a general projection and a trajectory is a trajectory is an extrapolation of what we're currently doing out into the future, whereas a projection is just um, it's an amalgamation of different. Uh, you know, possibilities and those possibilities are extrapolated to the future. Uh, but our current trajectory, according to the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, uh, is that we are on a pathway of eight to 10 feet of global average sea level rise by the end of the century. Um, which, which is quite <laughs> much more dynamic than what's released in the IPCC and I wanted to ask Jim, why do you think there's such a discrepancy between what's released in our national reports, uh, you know, either the age of consequences or the work that's being done at NOAA uh, and the intergovernmental panel on climate change? Well, first of all, one question I have for you is of these trajectories that you just uh, laid out. Uh, by, did they put a, is it by 2100? Is it by 2050? that uh, the Pentagon has uh, stated in the uh, three scenarios you just described. As an example, you said 1.3, 2 degrees C, but uh, did they uh, state at, by what year they think that will happen? Yes, they did. Um, and I will certainly link you the document after this conversation, uh, but I'll repeat sure. it again that for the expected scenario, um, this was the, I guess, best case scenario, uh, it was 1.3 degrees Celsius above the 1990 baseline by 2040. Their severe okay. scenario that includes dynamic feedback was two degrees Celsius above the 1990 level by 2040. Uh, and then okay. their catastrophic scenario was five degrees Celsius above 1990 by 2100. Okay. Um, well, you know, you you uh, made the uh, the difference between uh, projections and trajectories. Keep in mind that a lot of the models that are used are based on you know, the data. You know, you, dev you devise equations that fit the data. We test those models to make sure that the models will actually reflect what has already been observed. And once we get that to within at minimum 95 percent confidence some of the newer models are trying for 99 percent confidence but to get really accurate uh, pro projections slash trajectories you need a lot of computing power so a lot of uh, research institutions are basically saying we need funds to develop really uh you know massive supercomputers so that we can put in all the data, all the equations, and so forth. Having said that, I have seen, and I've, and I've done this, videos on this on my channel, that the models I'm seeing, when you look at the, the data, when you look at the equations, and you then, you know, run it out, what are the predicted values? And think of, you know, when you learn about basic uh, linear regression, right? You got, you fit a line through the points there. Okay, so at some point, you know, if we have this value of X, what's the uh, anticipated value in Y? Now take that and take it to about 100 degrees of complexity and 
you've got climate models. The point is that when we do that, the projections I'm seeing by 2100 is uh, 5 to 7 C. Now, they these models go back to basically uh, 1850 or so, the start of the Industrial Revolution. But so when, so when they do that, the models I'm seeing say 5 to 7 C above 1850, the pre-industrial uh, uh, revolution levels. Some models are all saying 7 to 9 C by 2100, and uh, others are even saying 9 to 11. Well, when you get to that realm there, all the ice in Antarctica is gone. <laughs> At that, of course, it takes a, you know, a couple hundred thousand years for it to all melt, but it will be on its way. And then you get to a point where uh, what's called hysteresis, that even if you were to cool the planet down to pre-industrial levels, you won't be able to refreeze all the melt. And that, that's what a hysteresis is all about. So I'm seeing models that basically state 5 to 7, 7 to 9 in that realm. So you want to say maybe 7. And, of course, with that, you know, you're going to lose ice from Greenland, the alpine ice, Antarctic ice. You know, with that comes an accompanying sea level rise of, I'm seeing 3 to 5 at a minimum. I'm seeing some cases, and that's by 2100, of up to 10, maybe even 20 meters. And again, it's just by using the equations and, and then, tr you know, as you would say, using the trajectory. If I am not mistaken, I believe that the uh, Pentagon has stated that climate change slash global warming is a national security issue. That is correct. And if, you know, to your question about what, what's with the IPCC, and why they, you know, why their projections so downplay? It's it, it goes to all the political uh, points that you have uh, mentioned, and the fact that the models they use are linear; they're not exponential. When when you do the when you do the models correctly, when you get you know your your best R square value, you know it, you find that you have exponential functions. The IPC is using linear function. Linear function is going to downplay. And so the projections are going to be on the low end. And, you know, as a, you know, putting aside, you know, it's a political body, whatever, as a, as a, speaking strictly as a scientist, I see that and I'm like, that's just bad science. You know, you're just using wrong models. And it's not a case of, you know, a lot of people have this mistaken notion that when scientists use models, they're just making stuff up. Oh, let's just see this. Let's just throw this and yada yada. Stir the pot a bit and see what happened. No, uh, you know our models are, as I described before. We try to get, you know, we try to devise the equations. We input the data and we try to get the models to reproduce what has already been observed. And once we do that well, then we proceed out. I mean, I've looked at papers where they develop models and they basically say, "Hey." It's weak in these areas here, so we need to fine tune this part of the model. And once we get to that part of the model and we think it's better, then we'll be at the stage where we can start making you know, projections outward. And they state that. But it's fine to publish such things as long as you're stating this, because like everything else in the scientific community, we're there to share information. So they say, okay, we're working on these models. Here are some good aspects. Here is not so good aspects. Here are where it needs to be improved. That's science. That's what we do. You know. So, well, but when you get a good model, and you say we're projecting out this. You know, this will happen. You know, listen to what listen to what those models are stating, and the IPCC simply does not do that. As an example, maybe this would be a good time to pull up that uh, uh, graphic, Sandy, uh, page fifty-seven. Box 2.2, please. Granted, this is from uh, some you know, from the 2014 um, report, but um, when you look at the different scenarios that they out, uh, that they include in there, a lot of them are just really they're not showing exponentiation, and uh, that's you know it's. It's just, it's not accurate. But uh, let me put it that way. It's simply not Am accurate. Am I on the and, right page? 
no. Uh, you need to really scroll down. It'll just look for, it'll be a blue box. Okay, you're on page 47. You got to kind of run down a wee bit. Hmm. There's an example of the ocean. Uh, uh, that's box 1.1, maybe box 2.2. I'm sorry. I thought I had it set up right. Uh, you're on page 42. Yeah, you need to go to the like, I'm on 63. Says I'm on 63. Look, look, look in the bottom right-hand corner. Look in the bottom right-hand corner. Oh, it's, okay. It's, Here we it are. scrolls different. It scrolls differently. Yeah, I know. Just tell me. I'll do, I'll, we'll get it. Everybody just adjust your eyes. <laughs> From <the> fast-moving <laughs> screen. <laughs> okay. Well, we're not data. We can just blink and read it at Whoop. once. Wait a minute. <laughs> no, no. Keep going. Keep going. All righty. Sorry about that. I really am, guys. I had it all set next, up, and I next page, right there, right there, right there. No, 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 right. no, no, right there. Okay, now take a look at these. Uh, okay. First of all, they have uh, the blue box. The blue box. It's scroll box down. Box two, I three. Want, I want no two, 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 two. I that got one. it. Yeah. That one there. <laughs> I'm leaving. Bye. <laughs> Okay, so these are the uh, RCPs, right? And uh, you look at these uh, figures here. Okay, they have different uh, scenarios based on what they project to be the increase in CO2 levels. When you look at these here, do we see any exponential functions that, that would actually truly reflect what the data is actually indicating? No. I mean, you look at this one here, the, the, the uh, what they call the most likely scenario it's almost like a straight line which one is the most likely scenario i'm sorry uh this one the uh, black line uh, i can't uh, see no, with your more, cursor so oh that's right yeah duh uh, <laughs> that's why i'm trying to eliminate uh, that for the yeah for the audience it, it's the uh will be rcp 6.0 it's sort of i don't know was that orangey color i'm not good with describing colors i'm sort of like <laughs> it's the yeah, second one kind down. Of a yellow orange color. Yeah. Yeah. 6.0. It, yeah. That's that's kind of a straight line. You know, and, and for people that's who the, don't understand, um, so the IPCC it groups the scenarios. Uh, so RCP two point six is kind of like a best case. Uh, RCP yeah. four point five is more moderate. Uh, 6.0 is, is extreme. And then of course the 8.5 would be the kind of catastrophic. So when Jim right. says, look at six, that's actually a fairly aggressive scenario or should be, but as you can see, as it's rendered here at the IPC, it's not at all, um, no. which is alarming. <laughs> and this is my, uh, a major criticism I have of them is that they're assuming linearity when that is not what the data indicates. Now, if the data indicated linearity, okay, fine, good, but it doesn't. And quite honestly, I just look at that and I basically say, well, that's just crap science. You know, when you, when you it basically ignoring what the data is indicating. Well, I also say this is why the integrated panel, the RCPs are, again, they're not just scientific models, the RCPs are not the same as the uh, coupled inner comparison models or the SIMP, like for example, the six, the RCPs are based upon the SIMP six, right? But the RCPs are supposed to also interpret policy. Notice that if you see the carbon dioxide uh, graph, it levels off, it flatlines, even at the uh, 8.5 scenario it flatlines at the end of the century, you see. That's assuming that policy is in line that will flatline emissions, you see. So, so, so in a way, um, you know, they're assuming that we're gonna have policy in the worst case scenario that, that flattens the curve when it comes to our emissions. But in fact, we can't say that, right? Because the worst case scenario would in fact be that there will be no policy in line and emissions go completely out of control. Notice it's not even really factored in here. Uh, you have a gray area, which is a margin of error, um, saying right. that we will yeah. possibly, possibly will do this. But even that's not even exponential. Um, no. You know, that that's actually kind of just, just uh, a linear trajectory, like you say, of what we're currently doing. 
Um, and then just for our audience to realize, look at these graphs, everything that is below worst case, notice there's some funky curves that they do. It's because yeah. they assume uh, they assume carbon <laughs> dioxide and CO uh, and methane removal from the atmosphere, uh, uh, which which is just quite absurd. Um, so so not only do they not talk about the exponentiation, um, but they also include in their modeling technologies that don't exist to remove CO two from the atmosphere at scale. Yeah, and. Uh... It, it, those are all excellent points, and you, in my view, uh, those are erroneous assumptions to be making. You know, the, oh, you know right? I mean, I've I've been seeing this headline: scientists got this wrong. They didn't. They didn't predict this would happen. Blah blah blah, and all these other things. Hey, we're doing the best we can with the model, but again, like everything else, scientists will make recommendations. It's up to the politicians to heed those recommendations and actually implement those recommendations. And I don't know about you, but I am not seeing much of that happening around the planet. And as long as you have, you know, as you're saying they're trying to re reflect, you know, the political, maybe economical uh, aspects, whatever, as long as you have this notion of capitalism, I hate to say it, but you know, capitalism is not going to allow necessarily for carbon removal. You know, unless you, you know, part of it is developing the new technologies to remove carbon removal. But here's another thing, and this is a major, major flaw in the IPCC. They're assuming that, hey, we pulled down CO2 from the atmosphere and we're good. But as you mentioned earlier, the methane that they report on is only from human activity. We have already kick-started feedback loops where the permafrost is going to continue to thaw, going to continue to put methane into the atmosphere. The warming currents are going to, to thaw out the substrate on the you know, East Siberian uh, shelf so that that methane is going to be, and, and I've got videos, I, I, I posted a video of methane bombs coming out of the ocean. I mean, and th this is just happening all over the place. You know, whether you go to East Siberia and the Laptev Sea, it's just, you've got methane gurgling out. And the IPCC ignores that. So th they're, they're basically erroneous in thinking that if you just take the, the CO2 out of the atmosphere, everything is good. Why is that erroneous? Because they're making the assumption that the atmosphere is the driver of climate, and it's not. It's the oceans. And that goes back to the point I said earlier. You've got all that heat energy. That heat energy, that's thermal inertia. That thermal inertia is going to diffuse into the atmosphere. You can pull out all the CO2. You can get the CO2 down to 218 parts per million. You have all that CO2 as the oceans continue to warm, that solubility uh, and saturation is going to be reached. The CO2 that's in the ocean will outgas back into the atmosphere. And there is a bit of a lag. I mean, what we're seeing now is kind of like the CO2 of 10 years ago. Well, the CO2 of now, we're going to be seeing that 10 years down the line. And I don't see that being accounted for. Right. And Sandy, can you bring up the graph that shows um, the different conferences of parties uh, that we've had over the last 25 years leading up to the Paris Accord and our CO2 uh, level? Here it is. Uh, this mm. is a graph that shows, and, and by the way, it's, of course, we're closer to 420 parts per million. Uh, but just to bank off of what Jim said, that science is supposed to be making recommendations. And obviously from the IPCC, uh, we're quite critical of the, rec of the best recommendations they could be making in the first place. But even, even, even with the low quality of recommendations or uh, the questionable quality, I should say, uh, recommendations from the IPCC, this has been the reality. From Rio in 95 to Berlin, Kyoto, The Hague, Copenhagen, 
Doha to Paris in 2015, no conference has had any discernible impact on the level of emission into the atmosphere. Um, and this is a sharp curve. And we are increasing at the current rate at almost 3 ppm of emission into the atmosphere a year. Uh, and this is, again, just the CO2 number, not the CO2 equivalency number. Um, yep. And so this is actually quite alarming. And remember what we get out of Paris is that the top emitter in the world, China, and I don't, I'm not blaming the climate crisis on China, but this is seminal to understand. China emits about 10 billion uh, tons of emission into the atmosphere every year. They won't peak under their pledges until 2030. So we are right now uh, in really an unprecedented level of crisis. This was applauded at the Paris Accord, um, but this keeps us nowhere in line with actually meeting those Paris uh, pledges if China was to do uh, that sort of pathway. Uh, and of course, we know that it's, it's in fact worse than that. The IEA, the International Energy Agency, has reviewed uh, the so-called pledges the countries have put forth and said that even if countries, and again, they use the sort of conservative methodology as the IPC, they say even if the countries uh, were committed, uh, we would get between 3.7, or excuse me, 2.7 to 3.5 degrees Celsius of global average temperature rise by the end of the century anyways. Uh, but what they say is that countries are not even committed. So if they were committed, it would be committed to a catastrophe level of warming uh, and no countries or almost no countries at present are in fact committed. Um, and this analysis, as you say, um, undershoots, uh, you know, the latest models. And I just wanted to ask for clarification, Jim, uh, the models that you are talking about, uh, my familiarity is with the SIMP 6 and in generation six, there are models that show uh, at the high end, a possibility of seven degrees Celsius. Are you referring to the SIMP-6 models or are you talking about another group, another ensemble of models? I'm talking about another uh, group of models, like for example, MODIS, uh, a group of models, um, basically independent of the grouping that you have mentioned. Uh, these are papers that uh, some, some are published uh, or, or based on the work of American scientists. But a lot of the papers come out of uh, Potsdam, Germany, that are, look, are looking mm. at uh, because they uh, they kind of like at, at this point, in my opinion, they're probably doing some of the best work on the climate uh, issues and the and the climate question. And so I'm looking at those models there uh, when it comes to say, for uh, example, looking at what's going on in Antarctica. I'm looking at the British Antarctic Survey, BAS. So I look at the, that research group. Uh, there's some research uh, uh, folks out of uh, the Scandinavian countries that I'm looking at. So um, I, I, tr I try to keep my pulse on a lot of different institutions from around the planet just, just to get the different perspectives and to see how they approach the questions, how they approach the methodology, the modeling, and so forth. And there's some good work done in America and Canada, of course. Some perhaps, you know, not so good, like anything else. But um, what I'm seeing coming out of uh, Potsdam um, is some of the best science uh, on, on climate. And of course, uh, the Potsdam Institute in Germany was formerly head by uh, Hans Joachim uh, Schellenhofer, who's actually issued the phrase that we are now in the end game uh, when it comes to climate. So uh, yes, quite seminal work uh, coming from our German friends. And uh, you are and, right to and, point and out I, that. And I am glad you said the name because I knew I was going to butcher it. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, would you I, I, like I, to I, take questions? <laughs> would you like to take questions, gentlemen? Absolutely. Okay. I will pull them up, and uh, I will stay in the background and, and 
read the question. First was a comment by David McHugh, hypnotherapist. Guy has always said that the IPCC didn't include feedback loops and tend to be linear. Sea level rise and nuclear power stations are a crisis waiting to happen. Methane is another factor. Either of you want to comment on that statement? Well, um, it looks like Guy and I are kind of on the same page. <laughs> uh, and don't forget, you know, Guy's specialty is aerosols. And he actually says that as we clean up, uh, you know, the emission, we're actually going to be cleaning up the, uh, the aerosol and the particulate matter that, get, that gets put into the atmosphere. His research indicates that aerosols uh, have actually kept things a little bit cooler. So now if you start taking off the aerosol, that's kind of, according to his work, that's going to open up the door for even uh, further warming. And so that to me is sort of like a, a kind of an almost an F you on top of everything else. <laughs> well, what I would just add to that is that um, not just Guy McPherson, but Dr. James Hansen, um, yeah. was writing in the yeah. early two, 2000s about the aerosol massing effect and um, his calculation at the time, which I do believe was 2005, was that the present amount at, at the time, 2005, at the present amount of emission of um, sulfur dioxide particles into the atmosphere and other particulates, we were seeing about um, one degree Celsius reduction in um, radiative forcing uh, from that effect. And so, if you, you know, people say, well, well um, there's been, you know, attempts to discourage uh, this by the mainstream media, uh, the hidden um, heat spike is what they called it, um, saying that it wouldn't be that severe. But what they what they weren't pointing out is that actually one degree Celsius, a sudden change of one degree Celsius global average is quite severe. That's not just a it little is. bit of warming. That's that's quite severe. Um, that's almost a hundred percent of the warming that we've seen thus far uh, to date. Um, so, so that would be catastrophic in any amount of time. And we also have to realize that it's probably above one degree Celsius, it's probably above a degree Celsius now, uh, because in 2005, China was emitting uh, quite a bit uh, uh, less uh, um, than they are today. Um, and plus, we're seeing other countries in the developing world come online and burning much more coal than we were burning in 2005. So it's, it's, it's not at all clear. Uh, where we are, but I would imagine that, that we're still, at the very least, we're still around that one degree mark of, of hidden temperature. And, and uh, pick up on your point there, you're absolutely correct in mentioning Dr. Hansen because he's done a lot of excellent work on on a lot of atmospheric stuff, with specificity aerosol. And this is something that right now has really been annoying the crap out of me with what I'm hearing about Michael Mann uh, spout these days. It's like he's kind of, I hate to say it, I think he's lost touch with reality. <laughs> and he's someone who has done good work in the past. And to see what he's saying now, ignoring thermal inertia, you're a physicist, you should know better about thermal inertia. You know, he's recently started saying something, oh gosh, the, the oceans are a concern. Well, no shit, Sherlock. I mean, I've been talking about the oceans for quite some time. And it's it's frustrating, too, because he gets a lot of press and a lot of airtime, a lot of interviews. And, you know, I know Dr. Hansen's retired, but, geez, I just love for him just to come out of retirement and do some interviews. Okay? He's done with doing science. Okay? He's, he's worked hard. He's earned that. But I would love to see him just come out, do interviews to kind of tell it as it is. Well, I will say in the memory of Stuart Scott, I mean, uh, he's worked very closely with Dr. Jim Hansen to get him um, to do interviews, uh, including going to the, the conference of party and shedding a lot of light on, you know, Dr. Jim Hansen's, you know, and, and, and what I saw was very clear in calling out the conference of party as a scam that is being led by the fossil fuel industry. Uh, mm. Which, which I thought was was quite escaping attack, <laughs> and you don't, you you don't, hear, you're right to say you don't hear that sort of talk from um, people like uh, uh, Ivory Tower, Penn State, uh, Michael E. Mann, um, who who I think has become more of a political uh, figure than a scientific figure, at least on the question of climate change. 
Um, he's yeah. really gone out, you know, duking the buck, saying that if you talk about catastrophic sea level rise and its impact on coastal infrastructure like nuclear facilities, then you're engaging in sort of climate um, uh, doomerism. In fact, I called in at the time Tom Hartman show today uh, to talk about that because Tom Hartman's been giving a lot of word to um, people like Michael Mann um, trying to dictate the climate change narrative. Um, away from the more serious talk about the implications of climate change, and I was booted off the air for doing so um, because no there is an agenda. Shit, I'm there, sorry. There is an agenda. Really? <laughs> wow. <laughs> there is an agenda um, to kind of uh, make a blockade of this is how far we can go in terms of the public conversation on climate change. Um, but I think it's actually important that we do what we're doing here and try to illuminate people to the reality of the crisis. Um, and even uh, when I was at Appalachian State University, um, Professor Drew Schindel from Duke University, who's working on the um, IPCC 6 assessment, uh, when I asked him about the absence of methane in the, in the uh, report, he told me in front of 50 people that, oh, it's all there. Um, and kind of shut me down without actually explaining the fact that well, yeah, if you're talking about methane emissions from agricultural sector, but if you're talking about um, from the uh, terrestrial and subsea permafrost regions, it's not there at all. Uh, but of course he did. And I think that um, a sort of academic um, has, uh, I, don't, I don't want to get too much into people's motives, but I think it's clear that some people don't want to cross uh, a, a line in terms of having this discussion? Well, you know, uh, when you th to go back to the terrestrial methane source, just look how much land mass Siberia, you know, Eurasia covers and the whole, I mean, the, the boreal forest is the largest terrestrial biome and there's a lot of permafrost underneath the grounds there with a huge amount, we're talking gigatons and then some of stored uh, carbon. Uh, talking with Igor Smelotov, you know, who, who's done a lot of work on the terrestrial part of, you know, looking at the methane questions in Siberia, as well as he and Natalia going off into the Arctic Ocean. He, he I remember him telling me, we, we used to have conversation. I remember him telling me, saying, my two concerns are, how much is there? That's what we're trying to get a handle on. How much is there in the ground? And at what rate, and that's the big one, at what rate Will it be released? Will it be a, a big, you know, slow leak? Or as, as he said, will, be, will the earth have a big <laughs> fart or a burp? You know, depending which end you want to look at. But that was the question. He said it used to keep, it, it keeps them up at night. How much is there and how fast is that stuff going to be released? Another point. And when talk about, you know, oh, how much of the coastal area is going to be uh, impacted by sea level rise. It's not just the coastal areas. Take something like the Mississippi Valley or the Amazon Valley, major river valley. If you start having one, two, three, five, seven meter uh, uh, rise in sea level, the sea level uh, rise is not going to be contained just on the coast. It's going to flood the major river basins. And now you've got brackish water in there. What's that going to do to crops? What's that going to do to aquifers? What's that going to do to drinking water? Mm. We already seen brackish water infiltrate in Miami. You know, it, it, you know. So it's the, sea level rise is not going to be contained to the coast. It's going to flood, you know, major river basin. Don't forget, North American continent was basically split in two by an inland sea during the Jurassic uh, period. So. Yeah, that's and, a, and, and also that, what course, I would this, add is, uh, is okay. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, Jim. Yeah. Uh, it, also, with that, if you have such flooding. You're going to have more people displaced. You're going to create more climate refugees. We're already creating climate refugees from fires and droughts and just intolerable temperatures. Start flooding out where people live. And where are you going to put these people? Where are you going to house them? How are you going to come up with enough food to feed them all? Okay. Sorry to interrupt. And then also, no, you're fine. Uh, look at what happened in our promo video. Uh, we saw footage from a aluminum and alloy factory in uh, he sent China 
I'm probably mispronouncing that, that exploded due to the floods. Um, this is in part what people are talking about when they're talking about nuclear facilities. But we have to remember, nuclear facilities are not the only heavy industrial facility uh, uh, development that's near the coast. Uh, we have uh, heavy uh, uh, oil, gas, uh, chemical, uh, fertilizer. I mean, there's so many different uh, heavy industrial machinery that we built up uh, that are going to be vulnerable to these sort of impacts. Uh, and that's what I think people are alarmed about. And we do have to now start talking about what is going to be um, our safety protocols in dealing with, with, with these sort of disasters as they hit us in the future. And we see it's not just sea level rise, right? But it's also extreme hydrological events. Uh, what I'm seeing actually start to permeate the media now uh, you know, a couple of years ago, maybe back in 16, you might have you might have sounded quite savvy by saying that every degree Celsius uh, temperature rise, um, you know, the, the atmosphere can hold five to seven percent more moisture. We're starting to hear that more in mainstream media, but people really don't understand what that means. Uh, we call the planet Earth, but in fact, 75 percent water. Uh, you start trying to change the atmospheric dynamics, five, seven percent more water. Uh, here and there, you really do start to see these catastrophic events. And what did we see? Uh, we saw catastrophic floods in New England. We saw catastrophic floods in West Germany uh, in Westphalia. And we saw catastrophic uh, 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 storms and floods in China. And to bring this information to our um, uh, audience attention, China now has been battered by seven typhoons this season. Wow. Well, you know, here's the other thing. Yes, as the atmosphere warms up, it can hold more moisture. But this is where it gets kind of crazy. Dry areas will become drier. Wet areas will become wetter. Because what will happen is the, the dry areas, because the atmosphere is now warmer and is less cloud cover, by the way, it will do what? It will suck the moisture right out of the ground. Now you Now the grounds are left dry, and now they're more prone to and we're seeing it burning down, all burning up. So you, you suck up that moisture into the atmosphere from the dry ground, that those systems move to where it's wet, and then it just starts dumping precipitation. You know, you know oh, we've got you know, you know, three months of rain in an hour. You start hearing things like that. And don't forget, we are also changing the jet stream. We're changing the jet stream so that instead of being zonal, where everything was tight, and it's now meridional. So it's going more north and south. It's, getting wa it's wavier. And because the temperature and pressure gradients are less and not as sharply defined, the jet streams are slowing down. And when they slow down, some you get what? You get systems that either move very slowly or they stall. And if they stall and you're underneath it, you're going to be pissed on for a long, long time. And this is what we're seeing. And so these, as said, you are absolutely correct in that all this extra moisture will have consequences. And I have been saying almost my entire adult life that this planet should be called Oceanus. Because, you know, 72, 75% of the surface is covered by water, not land. And I even did a video on that, by the way. But, uh, yeah. but, but uh, in all seriousness, we have all this moisture. You have all this heat. It's, it's packed into the ocean. And it's going to get released. And we're seeing all hell breaking loose right now, as it is. And there are ecologists who basically state that an increase of 4C will be sufficient to cause the extinction of the human race. Oh, sure. I mean, I think that, you know, uh, and Cindy, you can also bring up our next question here as well as I just uh, finished that comment to do what Jim said, um, that, you know, four degrees Celsius, people have to understand, you know, I did an interview with Dr. Jim White. He's a paleoclimatologist at Colorado uh, Boulder, he's the director of the Alpine Arctic Research uh, Institute there. And um, he was illuminating me on the fact that, you know, we're talking about global averages, sure. But, you know, nobody lives on a, on a global average, right? 
uh, mm. you know, people live in, in localities. And what he's explaining is that particularly for North America and Greenland, he's worried that we've seen uh, in the a geologic past that we can see um, five to 10 degrees Celsius shifts in regional climate within a human lifetime. In fact, he said it could be as fast as a college career. Um, and so, 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 and, and, and look, we are seeing, I mean, 116 yeah. degrees in Portland, 110 in Edmond, um, Canada, Alberta, Canada. I mean, we, we really are seeing dynamic changes unfold before our eyes. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, what was I going to say? But, uh, yeah, we, we have all this stuff going on. You have the 4C. And don't forget, the hottest the planet had ever been was during the PETM, right? The uh, Eocene uh, Thermal Maximum, where temperatures were basically 12 to 18 C above pre-industrial revolution uh, you know, levels. It took some time to build up to that, and it took some time to cool down from that. Millions of years, 53 millions of years uh, to be... A, a, uh, <laughs> Right. To, to give you an idea of that. But yet here, going back to what I was talking about, those, you know, models projecting a uh, five to seven or seven to nine uh, scenario increase by 2100. That's halfway to the PETM. So in a basically, it, if you want to be generous in 200 years, we're going halfway to the to what took millions of years the PETM. So this is something that I'm always trying to uh, stress is that it's the rate of change that's the really key factor here. And that rate of change is at the point now which, which ties into the things that are exponentiating. And I'm now saying that the exponentiation itself is exponentiating. It's mm -hmm. almost like if, if you started out with my basis, uh, you know, 3.2 to the X, it's now going to 3.7 to the X. It's now 4.1 to the X. I mean, it's it's just constantly changing and with the dire consequences that we're seeing. And here's something else to think about. I mean, I've been up here in Alaska now 34 something years. I've seen a lot of changes in, in my time up here. We don't get the three weeks of 55 below Fahrenheit that we used to. We don't. It might get to... 42 below Fahrenheit for like three to five days. And then it's, you know, back in the 30 below realm or what have you. We don't see those extreme cold. We don't have the where the Siberian high decides to slide over Alaska and the Yukon territory. And you're kind of said, well, we'll just wait for this high pressure system to erode. We don't get that anymore. I can take walks near where I live. I can go on to Muskeg, which is kind of slow walking in the past. It'd be kind of squishy. You step on it and it squishes because it's wet. There's a lot of moisture there. And there's moss and all that kind of stuff there. Now when I walk on it, it's not wet and squishy. It's dry and crunchy. That's how much moisture, you know, as an example, how much moisture is being pulled out of the out of the ground going into the atmosphere. And you can bet you can bet your bottom dollar that's gonna be, you know, regional wide across the, you know that kind of biome start start adding that up you know take the integral if you wish across the entire planet of all these things going on and here's another thing that I, uh, we're starting to see plants are getting stressed out you hear people say well it's warmer there's more co2 that's great for plants not my no. garden Sorry, no. I, had a, I had a pipe in there. Uh-oh. No, because plants, like all organisms, have a preferred temperature realm. And now we're seeing what? When it gets too warm, plants are wilting because the stomata are opening up and they're losing water through transpiration. Here's the other thing, though. New studies are showing now the plants are so stressed out that they're no longer photosynthesizing. They're instead respiring. So instead of the plants drawing down the CO2, they're drawing down oxygen. And what's the product of respiration? CO2. Plants are now actually adding CO2 to the atmosphere. So there is another kickback loop that's been started that will increase the CO2, which, of course, we know what that means in terms of temperature. So, so we have that going on. There's just 
so many things happening that, uh, you know, we're now hearing scientists openly say, looks like we've blown past several tipping points. I'm now seeing this more and more in some of the private uh, correspondence. There is a lot of scary shit in plain English going on. And, it, you know, climate change is here. It's happening. And we're in the middle of it. Yeah. Sandy, can we get our next question? Okay. Uh, let me pull up the question from um, Audio Pervert. The Jevons Paradox. Why and how green energy is not clean nor renewable? Am I opening a Pandora's box on this one? Well, the if I can take this, uh, it's laudable. You know, if you want to use solar panel, great. You know, that's laudable. I, I you know, want to use wind power, go for it. Here's the problem. To get the materials to make the devices is not green. You have to go mining it. Well, if you go mining, of course, there's the ecological damage done from mining operations. But mining operations use heavy machinery that run on diesel. So you still I mean it, it, it comes down to that you have to create and calculate budgets. It, it, I mean, I spent I spent my career in the Arctic Ocean looking at sea ice uh, surface current and working out heat budgets incoming, outgoing, et cetera, et cetera. You have to do uh, budgets, whether it's heat budgets, carbon budgets, what have you. you. You have to do budgets to find out which is the lesser of two evils, if you will. So going, getting to uh, green technology, using green energy uh, is not carbon neutral, let's put it that way, nor is it carbon negative. I think and what I tell people uh, on the political side, answering on Green New Deal, because actually it's it's funny, I get from conservatives a lot of critiques. Um, a conservative will tell me, oh, look, wind turbines are not biodegradable. You have to bury them. And I say, how is it that you're able to recognize that, uh, you know, renewable resources have ecological impacts, but you just ignore ecological impacts of fossil fuels? More mm -hmm. importantly, though, what this should highlight for any sound mind is that actually living on earth sustainably is incredibly incredibly difficult thing to do especially at the scale that our civilization has grown um, and what that should say to people is that if you think about uh energy resources the sort of energies that we have are extremely primitive and and they are uh, resource intense um so fossil fuels, you know, or, or I should say renewables or what we're calling renewables, wind, solar, these technologies are just better than fossil fuels, but that's all they are, is just better um, because they have a lot of trade-offs themselves. Um, but fossil fuels are so bad in their use that they're driving the climate extreme. Uh, and one thing also I, I want to say to people is that, you know, we talk about climate quite a bit. Climate is now the premier uh, kind of biospheric ecological crisis we are facing um, because it over time um, just turned out to be such a heavy hitter. Right. Uh, but we are dealing with quite a number of other um, environmental and ecological crises that solar panels and wind turbines will do little to address. Uh, so I, I think people have to keep that in perspective as well. I totally agree. I mean, I, it, when I talk about, you're right, it's, you know, using like a solar panel is simply better, but my, what, what I, what I'm trying to caution those listening to me is that it's just because you're using the solar panels, yes, it's better, but you still have to think about where it came from, how it came to be. And that process is still going to be uh, carbon intensive in the, you know, it may in the long run emit less carbon, but it won't necessarily emit zero carbon nor necessarily cause a drawdown. So yeah, it's, 
you know, it's laudable to go that route, but just keep that in mind as, as to, you know, the process that, that creates that piece of technology. Absolutely. Okay, guys, um, I am, we're going on one hour and 18 minutes and, uh, really? uh yeah, you guys are, uh, you, you're, you're getting very intense. I think it's been awesome. Of course, I can't sit much longer. <laughs> let's, let's see if there's, uh, any more questions that I had pegged for you. Um, th this was early. I put it up. Rollins, which was here, and how much CO2 will the ocean release as Delta T rises to 5C, which can you explain to us what that is, either one of you? Well, Delta T, I'm assuming he means that uh, Delta means change in. I'm assuming, uh, you know, if the temperature changes, you know, by 5C or goes up to 5C. How much will the oceans release? Um, well, you have 168 uh, Zeta joules. Uh, sitting in the upper 500 meters, you know, even if say half of that went into the uh, atmosphere, uh, that's still a considerably a lot more than the seven percent that we have put into the atmosphere, uh, you know, that the atmosphere has held, you know, right now. How much uh, will that go into? Well, there's, there's your there's your ballpark of figure. This is you know, I don't have a model that I can draw off offhand quickly enough to see what that projection would be, but I can tell you what the source is, how much is in the source, and how much is in the source is basically 168 zeta joules sitting in the upper 500 meters or so. So that is what is available that could go into the uh, atmosphere. Will all of it go into the atmosphere? No. How much of it? That's anyone's guess. That depends on various physical processes. Okay, um, let's see. I had another question. Oh, he left. Um, Antonio, a couple of hundred years for Antarctic ice to melt? I presume it would be that much quicker. That was Erkwin. I don't know if he's still here. Well, think. Uh, I think that, you know, when it comes to uh, Antarctica, it's really hard to say how much melting would happen. I was recently listening to um, Stop Fossil Fuels uh, they had on David Spratt. Um, mm. And um, they were talking about the collapse of the Larsen uh, shelf. And I mean, we've, we've seen almost a complete disintegration uh, of the Larsen shelf and, and understand the implications of that. Um, that it's not the shelf itself uh, that poses the threat, but the fact that it holds back so much ice. Um, and once once the shelf has collapsed, we'll see a sort of calving, uh, large scale, and that the land um, that that the ice sits on is actually sloped, angled toward the ocean. And so we could see a rapid uh, recession of ice um, throughout the century. So it's, it's really hard to say. Um, you've heard the estimates that Jim's given, uh, not necessarily of how much ice we're going to lose, but the contribution to sea level rise. And I think he said um, uh, possibly 10 meters or more by the by the end of the century. Um, Jim Hansen has has certainly said multi meters. Um, he, his his statement was five or three to five meters. Uh, and then we have what Noah is saying, um, which is uh, two and a half to three meters at most um, by the end of the century. So that's what I would have to say about Antarctic ice. Right. If I may, uh, you, in addition to Larsen, the ice uh, areas that scientists are, and the BAS is the, the big on this one, they're keeping an eye on Thwaites and Pine Island. Thwaites. and. Mm -hmm. And they are concerned that those two are in imminent danger of complete collapse. And if that happens, that's going to be uh, it's going to contribute significantly. And it and, and also keep in mind you have sea ice that's around Antarctica that also holds back the land ice. But you also have the warming ocean. So you have the warming ocean, and all and warming ocean. All it has to do is be above zero C and it'll start melting the ice from underneath. 
and that is what was happening so you have ice that is extending out past the, what's called the grounding line so that it's basically cantilevered out into the ocean so now when you start melting from on because that's what the waves can reach you start melting that ice that ice snaps off and as you just said antonio then there's nothing holding back the land ice and that will literally stop uh start uh galloping away uh into the ocean and given the, the uh, direction of currents, the, those ice sheets then get brought into sub-temperate latitudes and they start melting. And they start melting, they start adding to a sea level rise. So there's a, and there's also the Brunt ice shelf uh, as well off Antarctica that uh, scientists are keeping a close uh, tabs on. All right, well and, listen. And something uh, that- Oh, go ahead. And I'll just really quickly, something that Michael Mann won't tell you, right, about these processes is that once, and this is why sea level rise, I think is so, because we could use theoretically geoengineering to um, manipulate atmospheric temperature, right? There is nothing we can do to stop the calving of uh, 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 glaciers. Um, and so to an extent, sea level rise is locked in and it's outside the purview of well for example whatever sea level rise we're going to get by 2100 is largely out of our hands now there's not any policy that we can do that's going to have a meaningful impact on what sea level rise we're going to see throughout the 21st century now that's absolutely correct and you're seeing more and more scientists basically saying well we've already started on this path and there's not much this is going to be happening and there's not much we can do i'm actually starting to see that in the literature in the peer-reviewed stuff um you know the the language has changed for, for certain. i mean i've done my share of writing papers stuff like that and we're always tend to be i won't say conservative but we try to you know just be very low key and almost very dry reading I often tell people if you can't sleep at night, just grab a scientific paper. You'll be you'll be asleep within five minutes. <laughs> well, <laughs> listen, <laughs> at that note, guys, <laughs> I but, but, am well, having to step in. <laughs> Jim, did did I interrupt you? Are you finished with that? I, I I just basically wanted to say that we're now seeing scientists in the peer-reviewed literature basically putting out very dire statements. They're, they're, no, they're not holding back anymore. And I welcome that. I really do. And I'll leave it at that. Okay. Well, I'll tell you, I think it's been an excellent show. We've had an hour and a half of good conversation. Uh, Antonio, right. would you like to um, close up the show for, for us? Sure. Okay. Um, Go for it. Well, thank you again, our audience, for being here. I know this conversation is intense. I know it's heavy. I know it's very informative. Uh, we try to add some humor to it here and there. Um, but we bring this information to you because we want you to live in truth. And we want you to understand the climate crisis from the best of our perspectives, as honestly as we can deliver the information to you. Uh, we understand that, you know, this is alarming information. But more importantly, if you're in Alaska or North Carolina, New York, wherever you are in the world, we're all here together. So that's the main message of tonight is that we are going into crisis, but we are going into crisis together. And we have to be honest about that. Well, there you go. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, all of you. DDC, Thank you all. there's too many people's names. I really appreciate all of you coming. Peace out and good night. Good night. Okay. Good night. Oh.